Hello everyone, it's an absolute pleasure to be welcome back uh, to talk to you again about JDST and actually now to be able to talk to you about the early science that JDST is doing. Um, since launch, um, JWST has been it's been a very big part of my life um, and I've been, I've been all systems go. Uh, first we're getting uh, JWST commissioned and, and ready for science operations and then with my own science um, observational campaign. And so I'm going to try and give you a highlight of some of the science results. Um, there has been so many already in, in less than six months of actual science operations that this is going to be a whistle stop tour of some of them with a focus towards towards the end, I guess, my own personal uh, science and highlights with, with JWST, of which there are some nice press release images related to that. So you'll get some nice pretty pictures along the way, as well as the cutting edge science that JWST is doing. Um, and I really like this comic that was uh, launched, well, th th this comic that was uh, put out just after uh, the first images came out, um, which basically says the best camera you'll have is not the one you have on you, but the one at L2. And L2 is the second Langarian point where JWST is located um, and is, ta is taking these stunning images and spectra uh, of the universe. Um, and I just I just like this. It was just the excitement around JWST is, is just evident just from the comic like this. So just to give you a brief overview uh, in case you aren't aware of what JWST is, um, it's the biggest telescope ever to launch into space. Um, its mirror is six and a half meters across, and it's made up of 18 segments. Um, it works in the infrared, so it's looking at the heat radiation from the universe, mostly. Um, and that means to work there as it's detecting heat, it needs to be cooled down to very low temperatures. Um, this is done mostly using the sun shield, um, which is this, uh, in this image, you can see these five layers uh, that are pink at the bottom and silver on the top that are optimized to re-radiate heat away from the telescope. Um, and that cools most of the instruments. Um, and then there's an extra special cool um, cryo cooler, which has no um, coolant involved, so it can work as long as the telescope lasts, that cools the MIRI instrument, which is the one I'm involved in, um, in a technical side, um, and is led from the University of Edinburgh by Gillian Wright. Um, and that cools the, the, the actual MIRI instrument to seven Kelvin, which is seven degrees above the absolute zero temperature in the universe. So that's so we can get a really good view at the very cold, at the colder universe. Um, Webb was launched on Christmas Day. <laughs> so that, that was a, a very different Christmas to normal. I had that on the television all morning. Uh, I think I'm glad my family um, indulged me on that. And I was very excited about seeing lots of my friends and colleagues on television discussing the launch of JWST. And I had a cushion in hand um, while Webb was launching and some whiskey to celebrate afterwards. Um, so it was a very good Christmas morning in the end, but a long sleepless night beforehand and not for the normal Christmas reasons. Um, Webb is a 10 year, well, it has a goal of 10 years for its science mission operations, but it's looking like at least up to double that. It's not currently clear um, what the limiting lifetime of Webb will be. So that, that's the whole decade, two decades probably of science that Webb will do to revolutionize our view of the universe. Um, just to put this in context of other great observatories. Um, so Webb, as I said, JWST works in the near and mid infrared. So that's slightly longer wavelengths than the Hubble Space Telescope with a little tiny bit of overlap, uh, which in the Hubble works at optical wavelengths, what we see. And then previously, the best um, infrared telescope prior to Webb was the Spitzer Space Telescope um, uh, that worked at the MIRI wavelengths and longer um, for um, compared to JWST. And actually, the primary mirror of the Spitzer Space Telescope was 85 centimeters, which is the same size as the secondary mirror in Webb to put the changing capabilities in context. So just moving on, launch. I can watch this now with relief and happiness. The launch was absolutely perfect on Christmas Day. It, it may have been a bit cloudy and, and uh, delayed a bit, but this is absolutely flawless de deployment and a wonderful job done by the Arian 5 team on this last launch. Um, that meant that the absolute perfect placement of the uh, telescope and launch made the fuel when you needed less corrections to get to the L2, uh, which is four times the distance from the Earth to the Moon. And so that's allowed the, the not the coolant, the fuel um, to last longer 
And so that's extent, that's essentially a large part of the extended lifetime. So the, the, I love this image, just seeing Webb being released away from the Ariane 5 rocket and off on its journey into space while it's in its compact um, it deployed fate and then it had to unfold along the way. So it was still a few more anxious weeks before that was fully deployed. Um, Post-launch, um, I was involved in commissioning. And if you have any questions about this, ask me later. Um, and this is where the, the telescope cools down, it unfolded to get to it, it, its uh, sun shield and the mirror, um, then started to align all the individual mirror segments and then eventually making sure all the science instruments were um, doing what they were meant to do based on the performance criteria and checking that that was all verified and ready for science operations. And so I spent the last month of this timeline actually in mission control, working all hours of the day and night um, on the JWST observations and commissioning and calibrations. So it was a very exciting time. And just to give you an idea, this is what mission control looks like. Um, the, I hope you can see my cursor. This is where the missions operation manager was sat, who was in control of the whole process, or mum, or mom, as you are calling over the headset. Uh, they had some timelines over here, what was being observed, and you had all these wonderful massive screens to look at. Um, this is where the telescope operations mostly are based. There's a glass um, divider here, and then I, I was sat over on the other side of this glass where most of the science instrument teams are based. Um, so it was a, a very intense few months, but a very exciting time. And so just to give you an idea of what had to happen during commissioning. Well, first of all, all the mirrors had to be aligned. And in this top corner is a selfie uh, with Webb when the mirrors are unaligned. And one star was highlighting one of the mirrors with the other mirrors out of phase with each other. So they, they're not highlighted. And I just love that, that Webb has this capability to take pictures of itself. Um, each one of these dots you see in this image is in, is in the same star, but just spread out because all the mirrors are all over the place. So the first stage was identifying which segment each one of these this, this star belonged to, and then aligning this to get this high resolution image. And I hope this video plays. As you can see, this process now is you took the individual segments, aligned them up to get match the mirror, but put them into focus, and then combine them and move them so they're all to produce this high resolution view in the um, infrared. The, the first time we've seen a star at this resolution at these wavelengths. And the very first MIRI data we got provided, I think, hopefully you can see this, this stunning picture in the large Magellanic clouds. So we went from this wise image in the infrared at the same wavelength to this image. Uh, and I think you can see there's a, a very difference in capabilities between the two telescopes. And I think these are only a, maybe a decade or so apart in terms of time. Um, where I, I just think it's amazing. And this is an area in the nearby galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a galaxy I've worked on uh, for my entire astronomy career. Um, and I've been never so happy for my science to be obsoleted in, in one picture. There's a complete change. This is an area of sky I'm very familiar with and we're seeing instead of just some blurry stars, this high resolution view of all these stars, galaxies, and this diffuse emission. Um, so moving on, uh, just to give you another idea, this is from my own personal science program. This has not been seen in the public before. Uh, the previous image is Spitzer, uh, taken on the same patch of sky. And mm. then um, this is NGC 6822, as you can see with NIRCAM. And I hope you can see the change in stars and the number of objects you can see. Um, so we really are on a, a winner and we knew Webb was going to be good when we started to get this, this in and, and beyond expectations. It was, it's been a, a very fun time seeing these first data. Um, one of the other instruments, which is spectacular, is the near-spec instrument, which is a multi-object spectrograph. So with this, you can observe many hundreds of objects with one go. And so the precision you need to do is you have these tiny little slits and you can need to put, it's the equivalent of putting a bumblebee uh, located 150 kilometers away in, in the size of one of these slits. Uh, I think the precision involved in that is astounding, but capable, and I think that's amazing. Um, and this is very powerful to get lots of objects in one go and efficient observing. And what you get during commissioning is they looked at the galactic center 
and got over 200 spectra um, of stars uh, towards the galactic center. So each line across here is the wavelengths of light being broken up into spectral resolution. So each line is a new different type of object towards the galactic center. So again, these are just some of the early commissioning highlights before the science even got going, but we knew it was going to exceed beyond expectations when we started to get this data. So I guess today I really want to talk to you about the science with web. And the really good thing about this is it's, it's a general observatory. It doesn't have a particular science focus. Um, so that means you can go to observing anything from objects in our own solar system, um, so nearby planets. Uh, you can't, apart from the sun, the Earth, um, Venus, and Mars, uh, we well, can observe Mars, but you can't observe anything closer to the sun than the Earth. Um, you have to look away from the sun at all times to keep it cool. But anything from just the nearby solar system all the way to the very first light in the universe and the very first galaxies um, can be observed with Webb. And I love that it has that capability. And this is designed to answer key questions and make breakthroughs about discovery and discoveries in the universe across the whole range of, of the distance scale. And to do this, um, we have these four instruments. There's three that work in the near infrared. Um, and these look for cooler stars, look at galaxies they can see through dust, so they can see through the darker patch of sky that may hamper observing. Um, and look into the heart of sort of star formation and into the planets. Whereas as the mid-infrared instrument is the one that operates from five microns onwards. And they're to look at planets, comets, asteroids, uh, dust worn by starlight, and, and formations of, of planetary systems in disks. The, the sort of where things are different optimized in the most ray shifted light. So they're the instruments. Um, and what can this do? Well, there's four main science themes. Um, the end of the dark ages, so when there was no light in the universe, that very first moment of uh, light and reionization, uh, to look at the assembly and evolutions of galaxies. So that covers how all the metals formed. So how do all the gold, uh, carbon, oxygen, how is that formed and how does that evolve chemically throughout the universe is one of the questions. This also includes how do galaxies get their shape? How do they change over time? How do you form spiral structures like the Milky Way? How do galaxies interact with each other? Those type of questions are covered in the assembly and evolution of galaxies. Moving a bit closer to home, um, one of the other main themes is stars and protoplanetary disks. Um, this is my own science focus. Um, so towards the end, I'll be showing you a lot of star images and, and disk images with JWST. And then even closer still, to look at planets and the origins of life. So just to go a bit further into this and start to show you some science highlights for this, we have this cosmic distance scale shown here with Webb nearby us and this wonderful array and cacophony of beautiful structured galaxies. And as you look further back in time towards the earlier universe, the shape of galaxies change, you get to sort of the area where you start to see the, the Hubble deep fields, um, when then you go to go further back to where the first galaxies form, and then you go back even further to the dark ages when there's no light, and then all the way back to the Big Bang. And so the idea of Webb is to try and observe the most distant galaxies. And what does this do, and why do we want to probe this scale across the, the whole spectrum? Is well, the number of stars change, and the rate of star formation changes as the universe happens. And there's this point called cosmic noon to redshift around uh, Z equals two, where well, that's when most of the stars in the universe were created. Um, you can then, the stellar mass of the universe changes uh, as you go from now to further back in time. And then also the chemical abundances change. It gets more enriched, you get more chemicals uh, as you come closer uh, to the present day. And so Webb is to aim and look back and try and reach um, the most distant objects you'll see. So there's quite a lot of, I think in the first three months, there was over hundred papers published on trying to find the most highest redshift object. And, and so I think we're somewhere uh, spectroscopically confirmed around 10 or so, but there's been claims of much further uh, objects. Um, so just to do this, um, looking on the first images and the first, the very first image released was a web deep field. And here's two views of this uh, web deep field taken during commissioning. 
the one on the left is taken with a mid-infrared instrument. Um, I think our team commonly refers to this as the skittle image because you, it looks the reds, the greens, the yellows, it looks very different uh, to the same image taken with the near cam instrument. So this is in the mid infrared and this is in the near infrared. What you want to look for for the most distant galaxies in this image is look for the really reddest things and things that are most like point. Um, and they're the more distant objects in the field. But just the absolute excitement of seeing this, it's a lens system. So this is why you see this blurring around you to a, whole, a large dense gravitational field. Um, but the amount of objects you see at high resolution is fantastic and stunning. And I think this made everyone's jaws drop when that data landed. Um, moving on a little bit then is to then try and confirm how far away these objects are. And the best way to confirm how far an object is, is not just the imaging, they're used to pick your candidates, but you really want spectra. Um, and so this was using that uh, micro shutter array or those wonderful slits you can open, the bumblebee uh, placements to look at objects within this field. Here's some zoom in of some of the more distant galaxies. And in, in the very first image, there was a, a galaxy taken from 13.1 billion years ago where that light was emitted. And the way this is confirmed is these key lines of hydrogen oxygen, um, hydrogen oxygen. And the longer they go, you may have heard of redshift, of things moving to longer wavelengths, the further something away, away is. So the more distant objects, those lines are redshifted the most. And so this is the confirmation, the same lines with the same strengths appear uh, in the same pattern. So you know what those lines are, but you know they've, they've moved around in distance. And so this was exciting because A, you could do this, but B, um, the, the, the emission from O3 is very difficult to do um, with ground-based instruments and, and with Hubble. So, you, but the fact you can do this for hundreds of objects with web in a couple of seconds is outstanding capability. So the community was very excited about this. Um, moving on, a, a, another web fellow, um, Emma Curtis Lake, has got some of the highest galaxies on record spectroscopically confirmed from Webb. This is in the Jade's Deep Field, and they've found and confirmed um, galaxies as far out as Redshift 13. And that means the light from these galaxies um, shown, so this is the furthest one, this red blob, uh, was emitted just 400 million years after the Big Bang. Um, whereas previously the record uh, for Hubble, the, the furthest galaxy, was a redshift of 10. So in this very first early data, there was at least four galaxies that broke the record. And I expect this record to keep tumbling down as the web mission continues and people get more data and go deeper uh, observing on a different object. Um, so, I, I, so this is the more high redshift objects. Um, this is a wonderful cluster of galaxies um, called Stefan's Quintet. Uh, so there's five galaxies here interacting with each other. Well, maybe not this one, maybe a foreground object in, in comparison to the others, but this is the Hubble image. And then this is the mid-infrared image taken with Webb, and it's one of my favorites. I really love um, this green emission you can see being stripped off these galaxies that interact. Um, they're, they're called PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, also known as burnt toast or car exhaust fumes. But th th these are prevalent throughout the universe. Uh, and I just love the fact you can see this being pulled away from these galaxies as they interact and swirl around each other. Um, the different colors tell you more about the processes going on. And this top galaxy, um, you can see this cross stage, which I know there's a point source in the center. And that's actually a super massive black hole where material is falling into the, the black hole and, and rotating around it. So this is a very interesting galaxy in and of itself. And I just want you to try and take a second to compare and contrast from Hubble uh, to Webb. They both give you very valuable information about the universe, but you see very different things between the two. You see a lot more stars in Hubble in, the, in this nearby galaxy uh, compared to the Webb images. Whereas the web, you really see the gas and the dust and these other materials light up from these galaxies interacting with each other. I think this is spectacular. And again, uh, the spectra, the power to go in. Now we're looking around this uh, active black hole in this top galaxy. 
uh, using the mid infrared MIRI instrument. And we can see material like iron and argon and sulfur and oxygen, that they're signatures. And uh, this thing here is amorphous silicates, which is you may commonly know as a sand uh, on your beach. Uh, so a sort of sandy object with all these wonderful chemicals around it. And this is the power of web. You can combine these wonderful high resolution images with the spectra to work out a lot of other chemistry and the, the, the physics going on. Um, so that's it for the higher redshift universe uh, and more distinct assembly of galaxies. Want to move a bit closer on the other end of the scale and talk a bit about planets. Um, and so one way to look at planets with Webb is to look at transits. And a transit is when you have a planet going in front of the sun and then moving behind the sun. And this technique uh, is well established. Um, as the planets in front of the sun, some of the, uh, the starlight is blocked and you see this dip. Uh, and as you go behind the sun, the, the starlight from the planet um, is hidden. And you can use that combination to learn a lot about uh, the planets, how many planets there are, their dynamics, um, et cetera. So, so it's a very powerful technique. And so uh, this is taken in June um, in time zone in, in Baltimore and Maryland where mission control is. And you can really see this transit effect is the light dipping as the starlight is blocked by the planet. And so again, this is one of the very first results. And you can use also this technique to look at uh, the atmospheric composition. So here you can see a lot of water vapor um, in these planet atmospheres. So the, the, the data, and then you have models to help you interpret what's going on. And so we know from the positions it's water, but we also can work out the temperature. And you won't want to be in this planet, that the atmosphere is very, very hot steam. Um, so not, not one for your visiting list in the future. And one of my highlights um, from Webb was taking this image. This was the first time the mid-infrared instrument um, did a transit uh, of a planet. Uh, we, the precision and timing to do this, it was, it was key. And I was on mission control uh, on console during the commissioning phase when this was taken. And you can see the raw data and the dip. So that this is the whole gory details of what you get. But the fact that you could see it almost with the naked eye from the uncalibrated data uh, was an absolute spectacular improvement compared to what needed to be done previously when lots of filtering and signal methods needed to be going on. Um, so th this is a highlight is taking the first planetary transit uh, with the web during commissioning for me. Um, not only can you do these transits, but you can actually take imaging of individual exoplanets. And so here's the very first exoplanet, uh, take an image taken by Aaron Carter. Um, so this is the star and then use this technique called chronographs where you block out the light from the central star. And um, so that the star is here, and this is the planet itself, um, taken from the near infrared all the way out to the mid infrared. So it looks like a blob, but it's the first time an image with web was directly, uh, a picture was taken across this multi-wavelength regime. Um, so there's lots of very exciting planetary discoveries. And I think, a month and a half ago, uh, Webb discovered it the very its very first exoplanet, um, and I think that will continue throughout the mission as well. Um, so planets, early universe, uh, all done. But now we're going on to my favourite topic, which is star formation and stellar evolution. Um, and so this is the Carina Nebula. Again, very stunning. One of the very first images, the number of people's desktop backgrounds I see walking past in the office that has an image very similar to this as their background is, is high. Um, this is a slightly different to the very first version because within this, um, we did some analysis. My office mate actually did this analysis. Um, fantastic science results. Uh, going in to look at then a deep dive of what was happening in this, this star formation region. And what you see here is a big transition from ionization fronts with blue to the dust and stars and gas where um, stars and planets form. There's lots of fantastic ex uh, physics happening here as the radiation hits the edges of these dark clouds. Uh, as you look along these ridges, you can see these red dots. They're all stars in the process of formation. You normally find them along ridges, um, the ones that are forming. The stars foreground are, are normally 
in these areas of clear space. So if you want to look for forming stars, you want to look for ridges. So these red objects are what you're looking out for, but just the high resolution view and what you can see. And here is a highlight, just zooming in on some regions. And this is the work that Megan Writer did, is to look for objects in the process of formation. Again, here, this is a zoom in of these red young objects along these ridges. And these create lots of interesting chemics and uh, uh, lots of physical effects on the environment. Um, there's zooming in here, you can see um, objects create that are, are forming, are being in the process of formation, create all shocks as material is falling in, it's swirling around, uh, all the material is condensing to make the star. And you can see, hopefully you can see these arcs. Uh, these are jets that are being propagated out from the central star um, through outflows, and then they start to make bow shots with, with interstellar space uh, at some points of interaction. Um, you can see here, again, in, in stars that are formed, um, there's all outflows going on. It's not a quiet process. You don't want to be near a forming star in the universe. Um, and all just, just this wonderful structure as you zoom in and zoom in on these images, and it, it's all over the place. So I think it's a... Uh, Fantastic, we can now see this in the infrared at high resolution. Um, some other beautiful images we're seeing are uh, the pillars of creation. So this is, shows a multi-wavelength view of the pillars of creation, which is a famous iconic Hubble image uh, shown on the left. So this is a, um, a bunch of cold dust, and then you look for your red objects where the stars are being formed. Um, and, and this is where the, the birth site of stars nearby to us. Um, as you go into the, the near infrared, you start to peel back the layers of dust and you can see further in to the process of star formation and creation. And what you really want to look for here is these tips. Um, before the, there's some slight look for these red stars right on the edges, all in these pillars, but you can see more, you can see through the material. Um, and here again, all the tips uh, are uh, where the material is the densest and the darkest, you can see that the star formation and incubation process happening. And what amazes me is just comparing uh, the difference in stars you see in the Hubble image to the stars you see in the web image. Uh, and that's because you might to peel back some of this layer of gas and dust to just be able to see this more material and the sensitivity change as well. And then finally, actually, um, this is the, the final image on here is the mid infrared image. And this surprised me the most because I was expecting most of the gas and dust to have disappeared and you just be left with these really red stars. Um, but that was not the case. Um, again, you do have some red stars right at the tip. This is the same star across um, the three wavelength ranges. But even in the mid infrared, the most powerful instrument to pulling back and seeing into the heart of dust. We don't see all the way through. Um, we still see all these PAHs uh, in green. That's what most of this material is. You see this fantastic structure, but even in these um, the areas where most of the stars are being formed, we're not seeing through there in the infrared. And so this was not what I was expecting to see, but still stunning nonetheless. Um, some more on star formation is, this was another press release, I think this was on the BBC as well, um, of, of highlights, you may have seen these before, is to look at how, what material stars are formed out of. This is a real image taken with web, it's not fake, it's not a press release, it's not an artist's rendition, this is a real image of a star, this is one of those shocks I mentioned before, and all the structure. And what this program is trying to do, called Ice Ages, is to look back to see the very first stages of star formation and the material that stars are made out of. Um, a big thing they look for of why it's called ice ages is to look for this water ice feature, very common in, in the spectra. Um, methanol uh, is commonly present. So you have your alcohol around these clouds. Um, there is carbon dioxide. And the fact you can see this at high resolution tells you a lot of physics about how this process happens. And you really don't want to be around these stars. These but methane, not good for the smell. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and then acetylene and all these uh, ethanol, again, all these very complex, quite dangerous chemicals that you don't really want to be around. But you can just zoom in in the spectra and then zoom in even more. And to be able to see these features, the contrast is outstanding. 
Um, and it's the images are worth a deep dive, but also looking for squiggles in spectra to tell you a lot about the physics. So, ah, I, like I said, every single image you take with web, either spectroscopy or um, pictures, are giving you a fantastic new view of the universe. Uh, and the images and the data is such a quality you can see it almost straight away. Um, just to move on a tiny little bit further, this is my own personal data. This is my own program uh, of the a star formation region in the small Magellanic cloud. Um, the Hubble data here is on the right, uh, the web data is on the left. So this is the same region, MCN observed from the optical to the infrared. And previously you had these dust lanes, um, and this is another site of massive star formation. Um, and what you can see here is a big difference. Um, the dust is highlighted, you can see all these processes. This uh, bar um, where these two lanes of dust are interacting actually is double in size, uh, which we, we previously didn't know. And we know the locations and processes of young objects. Um, I have this as a massive poster in my office. I think it's gorgeous. I'd love to see this in a planetarium. Um, I would encourage you afterwards to go and download this image and the other ones I've seen and just zoom in and zoom in and zoom in. It is absolutely stunning what you can see. And uh, just to give you a brief highlight, um, we have this dragon head nebula, which is star formation uh, ongoing. It's spitting out some balls. Uh, and each one of these, there's at least 20 different stars that are forming, currently in the process of forming uh, along the way. So this is, is one part of the images. Um, the, the Hubble pillars of creation I showed you before, um, we're seeing uh, over hundreds of these pillars of creation within this image uh, to put the star formation in context. The pillars of creation were taken in our own galaxy, but this is in our, our nearby universe. And then we're seeing all sorts of bubbles and shocks, gas within the region. So there's lots of science ongoing throughout this. And then finally to wrap up, um, I want to talk to you about evolved stars. Again, um, this is another wonderful image released by Webb. Prior to Webb, this was our best picture of a, a dying star. So this is a star at least eight times the mass of the sun. Um, and it's in its, its final stage of evolution before it probably explodes as a supernova. And our very best image before Webb um, was this one taken in 2009. I mean, interesting, but I wouldn't, you wouldn't say the most spectacular. You wouldn't be putting a poster of this on your bedroom wall. And then this is what we observed with Webb. Um, so just to go back, we went from this from 2009 with this, this dust shell um, to seeing this spectacular image of Webb. None of these are artifacts, this is all real. And what you're seeing here is a central star and at least 17 rings, if you count them, smoke rings. These are all PAHs again, um, emitted every eight years. And I hope this shows. Um, here we go. What's happening to create these rings is you're having two stars that are orbiting each other. And you have this dying star and then you have this massive, massive O star, which is at least 25 times the mass of the sun. And the, the dying star is creating, ejecting material into interstellar space. But as um, this other star comes nearby, that material condenses down and starts to form dust. And so that happens every eight years, like clockwork. And these rings, if you count them, the 17 of them, at least 17, cover over 130 years. So this is really nice. This is something that works on human time scales in the universe, which is quite rare in astronomy. But these rings extend over 10 trillion kilometers. So that's a very big number. What does that mean? That's actually four times the size of our solar system, <laughs> to put this in context. Um, and so we know also from the spectra the composition of these rings. And there were some interesting articles in the Daily Mail saying astronomers were baffled by this. This was not the case, or some people claiming aliens. It was one of the first images and amateurs released this straight away. Um, but at the same time, the, that headline was created we'd submitted our letter to Nature Astronomy and we had this model um, just showing the dynamics of the dust formation. So the model is actually aligning right up with the observations. And so I really love that power of observations and models coming together to give you knowledge of exactly what's happening to call the, create these sort of squircular square circle rings. It's not a, a, a complete ring. So I want to leave it there and just say so far, we can observe 
wonders of the universe. This is just a highlight, my personal highlights. There is so many wonderful data. Go to the website, have a look at the JWST data. It's beautiful. Um, the sensitivity, the resolution, uh, the capabilities of web are making a new era of science, a new era of science, and a whole new realm of discovery has begun. And I want to just say thank you to all the people who've uh, made this possible. There's been twenty thousand people around the world. Uh, this was me very tired because I've just come off a night shift and then trying to stay around for the group picture. But this is the commissioning team for the Mid Infrared Instrument, Murray, led by Gillian Wright here, who's based at the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh. Um, and just all the people involved, a small part of the machine to make this science happen. But thank you very much, everyone. And I'd love to try to talk to you about the questions or anything about web. So I'll stop sharing there. Well, thank you very much, uh, Olivia. What a, <laughs> my breath is taken away. Uh, it's a magnificent show and um, was worth waiting for. I saw Gillian right in the last picture. I mean, it must be absolutely extraordinary for her. I mean, 25 years she worked really on this till now. I hope she's able to deal with all the excitement. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move into questions. If I can ask perhaps some um, sort of technical questions to start off. The checkout, the cooling down and all this. Um, you were at Mission Control. Um, where is Mission Control? Um, Mission Control is in Maryland, um, which is in the east coast of America. It's in Baltimore yeah. specifically. Um, okay. So it's not, not too far away from Washington, D.C. It's about an yeah, hour on the train from the Washington, D.C. where Hubble. Yes. Okay. Um, That's, uh, that must be very convenient. I mean... Although it must be very depressing for the Hubble people to have you guys there. <laughs> uh, we did take over their building for quite yeah. a long time. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah the, the, the web people, uh, the web people took over a couple of floors, well, more than a couple of floors, yeah. and the Hubble people got shipped out to a different building than that. But, well, especially while commissioning was really, really ramping up. How, how yeah. long will Hubble go on? Because I notice you use Hubble as a kind of text you work from. You know, you're images were you showed us a hubble image and then you showed us wow <laughs> this is what web will do um i don't know exactly um i do know they're going to try and extend the lifetime as long as possible the people at space telescope are fantastic at extending and getting the most out of a, a telescope's lifetime and uh, yeah it, it while we have web it, we have a fantastic infrared view but to really understand um, the physics going on. It's nice to have the high resolution optical view and high resolution sub millimeter. And when I was picking my web targets, I was trying to pick targets that had both of those. Um, so my data would complement it and we could learn more about the universe by having this multi wavelength approach than just going for a new object. Okay. You said 20,000 people were involved, but how do you share out the science? I mean, do you have 20,000 people on each paper you write or? Uh, no. Um, so this is people, not just scientists. This is the engineers yeah. all the way over the 25 year lifetime mission. Um, I'm indebted for, to Gillian for basically getting this telescope ready for the heart of my career. Uh, it's taken a lot of her career to drive this through, for, especially for the mid infrared instrument. Um, and it's a long process. So people have obviously um, been in astronomers or been engineers or they've built bits, the end. Uh, components um, have all been involved from the start. So polishing the mirrors to mining, that, 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 that's everything encompasses. Um, the longest paper I'm on, which has everyone involved in commissioning, um, the commissioning paper has 500 authors. So they were the people on console for technical experts during that commissioning. So it's, they're, they're the astronomers and that, I think that will be the longest number of authors of a paper. Um, I imagine there won't be any typographical errors. That many oh. authors. <laughs> you would hope not. If there okay. is, it's a shame I, I think I will turn this over for more technical questions. Um, anyone wish to pose a question? We have some in the chat. Bill, can you? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Max, uh, if you if you wish to unmute yourself, you can do to ask your question. 
Hi, yes, thanks. What a great talk. Um, what an amazing project. Uh, I, I, I think it's incredible. Um, th th there was a little bit of damage to one of the mirror segments, I think, um, quite quite early on, which caused a bit of worry. Um, has has uh, that now been assessed? And what's, you said, a 20-year lifetime? I mean, is there a risk that more meteoroids could cause the telescope to be more seriously damaged? Um, we expect meteoroid hits throughout the lifetime of the mission. Um, the one you're talking about in particular was a bit bigger than we expected. And so we have, from the, from the first cycle, you could observe an object. Some objects could be observed twice a year, to, to avoiding the sun. Um, but from now on, for the rest of the mission, um, you're in a, you have to account for meteoroid impacts. So you can probably only observe one of those two times. You don't want to be pointing into a meteor shower with the mirror. You want to be pointing away from it. So avoidance has been taken, steps have been taken, and we're still not sure if that was just a one fluke event in the model and just happened very early on, or we may expect more about it. So there's not been a, another hit on that scale since that No, was so nothing far. close to it. Mm. Um, so I think the techniques at least are, are working to avoid these as much as possible. And yeah, I think, I suspect meteoroid hits will be the thing that actually limits the lifetime of Webb the most. Um, and especially for modes like the chronograph to image exoplanets, I think they'll be the ones that will be affected first. But when I say affected first, I mean, this is probably, this is far outseeding the lifetime of Webb initially predicted or, or even expected. So um, I wouldn't worry too much about, about it for quite a long time. <laughs> probably the, towards the end of my career is when you may want to think, oh, the moon's getting a bit dented, but no, I, I, I wouldn't worry. Phew. Okay, is there any more in the chat? Uh, yeah, there's a question from Alan. So, Alan, do you want to uh, pose your question? Sure, thank you. Um, that was a super talk, Olivia. Thank you very much. Um, I just wondered, uh, have any clues emerged from the observations so far about the formation of supermassive black holes? Because presumably they, they took some time to form and become millions of times uh, the solar mass, and so maybe there's a cutoff time um, after the Big Bang, you know, before they before they have time to form. Any any clues on that from observations? Um, I do know several supermassive black holes have been observed, but I don't know what the the outcome of the the results are. Um, unfortunately, that's not my science speciality, so I've not been following that right. Right. Um, with detail. But there. I know there are several uh, types of um, the a active galactic nuclear galaxies that are being traced, and that field in particular is moving. Uh, I think there's a few papers published each day, so that, there's ah. a lot of reading. <laughs> so, so maybe wait wait a year for it to settle down, and then okay. take take the highlights. But I, I suspect there'll be some movement on that, and 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 results on that. I just I don't know them off the top of my head. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Can I uh, just interpose and say if you want to ask a question and you don't want to put it in the chat you can use the raise hand facility which is on at least on the bottom line of my um screen in zoom and it says reactions if you open that you'll find you can raise your hand so that's another way to ask questions but anyone else from the chat bill uh, not not yet. So could could I maybe ask a question, Libby? So there was a, I think in the in the kind of the the, the regular media in the last week or two, there was uh, some uh, evidence that there had been some the size of some of the uh, galaxies formation had been larger than expected, uh, taken into account sort of you know the the time you were looking back, and uh, there was a little bit of speculation that might be. Uh, uh, some impact on the sort of the, the basic models for galaxy formation sort of wondered your views on that yeah i think it is becoming quite clear that galaxies are getting their structure a lot earlier than we thought and um, compared to theoretical models and compared to what we'd observed with hubble um that's the, the, the key thing here is our resolution capability which we hadn't known that before um so i think like all sets of good observations uh, and science uh, the models will now have to be adjusted to to see match what we we're observing. Previously, they um, thought, okay, they're, they're, they're all smaller and more compact and 
mm-hmm. in nature. But now, yeah, seeing these seeing these wonderful structures so early on means that the mm-hmm. stars. It's exciting times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I think it's going to be a lot of hard work for the community to, to get used to that set change in knowledge from what we thought we knew to what we now know based on observations. OK, so it's not not likely to affect the fundamental science, but it affects the aura. Uh, so we say the, the fudge factors associated with the model. Yeah, uh, the, so far, nothing has broken fundamental science. Yeah, OK. Um, but the, the actual de- the devil's in the detail, right? Yeah, that's over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, okay. so, so you've uh, uh, you've taken David's lead and found the way to put up your hand. So uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. Let me uh, I'll press a button. There we go. Okay. Oh, f- a fascinating talk and some beautiful images. But something that struck me is when you're looking at, say, the um, the pillars of creation. So what what keeps the dust in the pillars and it doesn't just become diffuse? What what are the forces that are are making these images? Is there any idea? Okay, so there's a there's a few reasons um, this happens. Is you get star formation in areas where of dense interstellar material. So something has either swept that material together and it 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 it, it forms. Uh, sometimes you think it's galaxies interacting with each other that causes um, bursts of star formation. And eventually it's just these small movements that eventually propagate down to, to move this material together so it starts to get denser. As soon mm-hmm. as you get denser, you start to get gravity, so then it starts to sustain its own gravity. And the reason why you see star formation in these really dark patches is that's where it's densest and the most gravity and collapsing material. Um, then within these star formation itself, you get bubbles and all energetic processes. So as one set of star formations occurred, and, and especially massive stars, they start to go supernova and that creates more shocks and then compacts more material together. And then that will cause a second burst of star formation. So what is happening is processes around our condensing material, increasing density, which increases gravity, which then allows stars to form, uh, both on the big scale of galaxy interaction and on the small scale of individual objects exploding or winds. Um, it's fantastic. And that's why yeah. some of these images just go in and look for all these structures yeah. of bubbles and and, and that's why you see a lot of star formation along ridge lines. Um, mm-hmm. That's when the material is most compacted by events. So just yeah, go, go and play. Uh, I would really encourage it. It's beautiful. You can just zoom in forever. <laughs> Fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, I think, Jim, you have your hand up. Yes, I was uh, hoping that Dr. Jones might say a little bit more uh, in her own sort of special interest area. I think it was metal. Uh, formation about what's changed because it's, it's clearly going to take 20 years to work out <laughs> the, all the consequences but you might be able to give us some uh, what has changed from your perspective in in, the, in your own more specialist area okay so what we're seeing is in star formation regions uh, in the metal pore universe like the that beautiful star formation image I showed you of NGC 346 is what we've learned is we thought in these environments, um, the high energy and different metals would create UV destruction uh, of dust. Um, But what turns, and that means that would make make it harder for planets to form, for instance, Uh, if you destroy all the material falling onto a star through different energetics, because there's not as much material there. Um, It turns that's not the case. And so we're seeing stars as low as one tenth of the sun in mass forming with this massive, this disk structure around it, which can survive. Um, and so that means metal poor planets can form as well. And so they'll have they'll have different composition to what we have. I think that's really exciting. And, and the consequences that mean for what elements are in the atmosphere or what even potentially life could form out of will be quite interesting. Um, we also see this much further away. We're seeing objects in the really metal poor universe um, change slightly in its composition, and, and that's that's exciting. Um, we're currently in the very first stages of getting to the grips of this. We're now the, the the spectra in itself are spectacular in what we can see in terms of the material, and so even while it's early days, we're learning a lot about the processes and how this change over cosmic time. Um, so, it, so it's. it's it's still very early on, but we know it in form earlier as well, a bit like those galaxies that form structure. We can know that actually 
a lot of the material around us is created maybe earlier. And we're seeing traces of this in the stars that are dying in supernova. Um, not what maybe where you not might not expect it to be. And answering how that survives or why it's there is still we're still in the oh look, we see it uh, stage of operations, not the oh, what does this mean fundamentally stage. <laughs> Okay, thanks for the hint. <laughs> okay, there's, there's a, a question from Peter Foxton, and uh, I think actually Peter's left, so I might just ask the. No, I, no, I haven't. I'm, I am oh, you here. haven't? Okay, you're down there. Go ahead, Peter. Actually, thank you for the talk, Olivia. This is a, a question about the operation of the telescope. Since it has been successful, is there a long queue? Um, for particular researchers to get time or to control where the telescope is pointed and who, who makes the decisions where the telescope is, um, is what it's used for. Thank you. Oh, okay, yes. Um, we have just gone through uh, asking for time to observe with the second year of operations. Uh, so this is, I think that finished just, just under a month ago. And what happens is astronomers or even amateurs or anyone in the world, in fact, can write a proposal to Space Telescope, which is the home of, of Webb and Hubble. Um, and you ask to observe a particular target. And so you have to write, it's around eight to 10 pages of technical and, and science justification of why you want to look at an object. Um, and then that is judged by a panel of your peers um, compared to all the others. So with this particular cycle, in the second year of operations, 1,700 plus observing proposals went in to try and point at the objects. Um, that is at least a factor of seven oversubscribed, if not more, uh, in terms of time available. So this is a very competitive process. Uh, and then you have um, a, hundreds of people, actually, then astronomers around the world, actually meeting at Space Telescope. In fact, no, some of it, I think, this year is online. Um, and then they rank those proposals and they give the highest ones the best score and they go forward to be observed. Um, as long as, uh, and then the schedule is put it in the schedule for the following year. So it's an, any, like I said, anyone in the world, even you could write your own proposal, uh, but you are competing against others. So that, that's how targets get selected. And those panels are split up by topic. So there's some on the solar system, there's some on the high, the distant universe, there's some on star formation. Um, balanced about by the number of proposals in each subject area you get. Uh, did that answer your question? Yes, wonderfully. Thank you. Right. I think we've got one, maybe the last question from okay. uh, from Vince Harris. So Vince, if you're able to uh, pose your question, please. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep, yes. all good. Yep, yep. I, I was a very interesting presentation. And I've been staggered by some of the results of the very, very early universe that we've seen and heard about. Will it be possible to actually view the universe as it was before matter formed, the first 350,000 years? With Webb, no. Um, Webb is very much designed for the, uh, the moment stars are, the first stars are forming and the first light is created. So that need, means you need matter and material to produce those stars. Um, to see further back in time, close to the Big Bang, you need radio telescopes. Uh, and that's what the, the cosmic background uh, ionization is, which you get the static in your TV. Uh, uh -huh. It's everywhere. Um, but no, so Web can't, Web is designed to see individual objects or galaxies or, or the very first general emission from after, after substantial materials formed. It won't see any further back than that. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I think I'd better sadly wrap up at this point. Um, what can one say? Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, what a terrific show, Olivia. I think you've carried us along with you. It's been an absolute delight to see both the images, but also to hear your enthusiasm for what you're doing. I mean, that's a magical thing. Uh, for me, I'm going to take home the fact I realized I'm one of the 20,000 because, of course, I negotiated Miri going on 
And indeed, the price I had to pay was to provide a launcher. Happily, my it took so long to get the thing built that I didn't provide the launcher. My successor but two had to pay. <laughs> but there you are. Um, I realized that perhaps I'm only 20,000 and a half. But whatever it is, it's immensely personally satisfying for me to hear from you what really is being delivered now after all those years. And um, I think it's magnificent. It's one of its, uh, you know, I always used to say it's like building the medieval cathedrals. And for me, that's this is part of our civilization. And well done. I think uh, we should um, probably, if you all unmute yourselves, you can join me in clapping, Olivia. So I'll begin. 